Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. And it's uh, it's good to see you all here today. Well, the the last few weeks we we were talking, we more or less concluded our discussion of the four methods of guidance for the bodhisattva. Bodhisattva, someone who concerns him or herself with the welfare of others as well as oneself. As, as it is said to save all beings to not just be preoccupied with one's own enlightenment. And the four methods of guidance for the Bodhisattva that Dogen outlined based on prior Chinese scriptures were generosity and kind speech, beneficial action and identity action. And we, we talked about this confusing notion of identity action, probably just confusing because of the name given it, but having to do with the idea of seeing oneself in others and seeing others in oneself. So much of Buddhist practice has to do with changing perspective, changing one's world view, one's way of looking at things in the direction of abandoning the ego. Abandoning self-centered view. In a way analogous to how Copernicus could make much more sense of the movement of planets when he abandoned the geocentric view. When Ptolemy looked at our solar system from a earth-centered view the confusing the the movement of the planets was confusing sometimes they would start across the sky and then change directions and move back the other way and it just didn't seem to make any sense but once copernicus had the notion that well perhaps the earth isn't really the center of everything. Maybe there's something else. And adopting the theory that perhaps the sun was more central to the solar system than the earth. Then the planetary movements made perfect sense. They were just orbiting with the centripugal and the centripetal forces balanced, forming ellipses around the sun. So the notion of changing perspective changing one's frame of reference is, I think, central to Zen practice and Buddhist practice generally. So I'd, I'd like to, to read a, a passage from, um, actually it's from the, the Russian literature. And um, I'll give you just a little background. Uh, uh, um, a while back, I I had the notion that, uh, well, 
uh, while I'm still able, I should I should read War and Peace. I'd never read War and Peace. I've heard about it all my life and never even read parts of it. It's a daunting text because it's about 1,400 pages, and that's why a lot of people haven't read it. But those who have read it find it a remarkable piece of writing. So um, I had the notion of reading it, perhaps not taking into account that I'm a slow reader and that it would take me uh, well over a year to finish the book. But I'm plodding along through it, and I encountered this passage that I would like to share with you. It involves a change in perspective. And uh, the background for this passage is that um, the Napoleonic Wars had just started or just started involving Russia uh, because the uh, French were uh, moving their way across Austria and um, the Russians could perceive that Napoleon's vision was to capture all of it, including Russia. So Russia and the Austrians collaborated in fighting the French. And uh, early on in those battles between Russian troops and French troops is when this scene takes place. And the, the main character is um, Prince Andrei Bolkonsky. Now, in the Russian army, uh, the, the, the Russian society was very class oriented and there was an aristocratic class and the sons of aristocrats ended up being officers whereas the sons of sort of townspeople merchants peasants ended up being infantrymen so prince andre being among the aristocratic class was an officer and had been through some connections, assigned to be adju adjutant to one of the um, uh, generals who was leading the um, defense or the defense against the French at this time. And he had been given an assignment to go carry a message to one of the other generals. Uh, the, the Russians were in this case, in this battle, um, pursuing an ill-fated attempt to push the French back. But they had miscalculated where the central troops of the French were located. And as a result, they were losing the battle. And the French were overtaking the Austrian and Russian troops and driving them back. And they were currently in retreat. Prince Andre, uh, we're given some background, has uh, at this early stage in the war, uh, a very romantic notion of soldiering and uh, sees himself, has fantasies of glory, uh, of being a, uh, a glorious conqueror. So he is given the task of giving this message to the other general. But meanwhile, uh, the Russian troops and the Austrian troops are madly retreating from the oncoming French. Uh, but Prince Andrew isn't really aware of all this going on. He just sees people running every which way and uh, notices that uh, the Russian flag has been dropped. Somebody has dropped it, perhaps a soldier who has been killed. And he picks up the flag and has the idea of rallying the troops. And he says, hurrah, roared Prince Andrei, 
finding the heavy flag hard to hold, but rushing forward quite sure that the whole battalion would run after him. And he wasn't alone for more than a few, uh, for more than a few steps. One soldier lunged, then another, and then the whole battalion was there, echoing his hurrah, running on and racing past him. A battalion sergeant ran up and took the flag which was too heavy for Prince Andre, and wobbled in his grip. But he was killed on the spot. Prince Andre snatched the flag up again and dragged it by the staff as he ran on with the battalion. In front of him, he could see our gunners, the people uh, operating the cannons. Some still fighting, some running towards him, with the cannons abandoned. He could see French infantrymen too, taking hold of our artillery horses and heaving the cannons the other way around. Prince Andre and the battalion were less than 20 yards from the big guns. He heard bullets whining incessantly overhead, soldiers moaning and dropping right and left, but he didn't stop to look. His eyes were fixed on what was happening over there near one of the cannons at the battery. He could make out one figure clearly, a red-haired gunner, a Russian, with his hat skewed to one side, heaving on a cleaning rod with a French soldier heaving against him the other way. Now he had a clear view of the two men's faces with anguish and fury, even though they had no real idea of what they were doing. What are they doing? wondered Prince Andrew as he watched. The red-haired man's got no gun. Why doesn't he just run away? Why doesn't the Frenchman bayonet him? He won't get far before the Frenchman remembers he, he has a gun and runs him through. And then, in fact, another Frenchman came up to the two fighting men with his gun leveled at them, thus probably sealing the fate of the red-haired gunner, who had no inkling of what was in store for him as he wrenched the cleaning rod away in triumph. But Prince Andre never saw how it all ended. All he felt was a terrible blow on the head, of which he was hazily aware of having come from one of the nearby soldiers, who must have set about him with a huge piece of wood. It didn't hurt much. What really annoyed him was that there was, that annoyed him was that such pain as there was distracted him and stopped him from seeing what he was looking at. What's happening? I'm falling. My legs are going, he thought, collapsing on his back. He opened his eyes, hoping to see how the fight between the French soldiers and our gunner ended. Was the gunner killed or not? Did they get the cannon or were they saved? But he saw none of that. Above him was nothing, nothing but the sky, the lofty sky, not a clear sky, but still infinitely lofty with gray clouds creeping gently across. It's so quiet, peaceful and solemn not like me rushing about, thought Prince Andre. Not like us, all that yelling and scrapping. Not like that Frenchman and our gunner pulling on the cleaning rod with their, sick, with their scared and bitter faces. Those clouds are different, creeping across the lofty sky, the infinite sky. How can it be that I've never seen that lofty sky before. And how happy I am to have found it at last. Yes, it's all vanity. 
It's all an illusion. Everything except that infinite sky. There is nothing. Nothing. That's all there is. But there isn't even that. There's nothing but stillness and peace. Thank God for that. So, that's a little passage there. And uh, Prince Andrew, by the way, doesn't die from that wound, from that uh, injury, uh, at least not that injury. Later on during the war, he ends up dying from another injury. But all of a sudden, there's this transformation brought upon by maybe a blow to the head. This complete change in perspective when all of this glory seeking, running with the flag, calling hurrah, witnessing the struggle between the French Frenchman and the red-haired gunner pulling on a piece, just a metal rod that they use to clean cannons as if it's the most important thing in the world. All of this seemed to him like vanity. It seemed absurd. And then as he was lying on his back, his gaze constricted to the sky because he couldn't move. And noticed the clouds just moving slowly across the blue sky. Completely changed his perspective, his way of looking at things at least for the time, for the time being. And then he drifted into <clears throat> unconsciousness. So I, I would like to, to pair that. Um, with another reading. And this is a passage I've I've read before, but it's been quite a while. So maybe you're, you might remember it or not. It's uh, from a a book um, in which there's a translation of the teachings of Zen master Hongzi. This translation is by Dan Layton. And Hongzi preceded Dogen, and actually preceded Dogen's teacher, Ru Jing. And is talking about, it's, it's basically uh, practice instructions, how to meditate. Narrowly interpreted how to meditate. but perhaps how to live in the world as well. And uh, this little passage is entitled uh, The Bright Boundless Field. So Hongzi probably would have been talking to his monks. The field of boundless emptiness is what exists from the very beginning. You must purify, cure, grind down, or brush away all the tendencies you have fabricated into apparent habits. Then you can reside in the clear circle of brightness. Utter emptiness has no image. Upright independence does not rely on anything. Just expand and illuminate the original truth, unconcerned by external conditions. Accordingly, we are told to realize that 
not a single thing exists. In this field, birth and death do not appear. The deep source, transparent down to the bottom, can radiantly shine and can respond unencumbered to each speck of dust without becoming its partner. The subtlety of seeing and hearing transcends mere color and sounds. The whole affair functions without leaving traces and mirrors without obscurations. Very naturally, mind and dharmas merge and harmonize. An ancient said that non-mind enacts and fulfills the way of non-mind. Enacting and fulfilling the way of non-mind, finally you can rest. Then proceeding, you are able to guide the assembly with thoughts clear, sitting silently, wander into the center of the circle of wonder. This is how you must penetrate and study. So this, um, some of this may be a little mysterious to understand, but very naturally mind and dharmas emerge and harmonize. Uh, by the use of dharmas here, sometimes dharmas are used, is a word used to describe the Buddha's teachings. Other times it's used to describe the myriad things, the myriad phenomena that we experience as humans the objects, concepts, everything, dharmas. And talking about the mind and dharmas harmonizing, of course, reminds one uh, of, of Dogen's most famous quotation, which is the Buddha, the, the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self and to forget the self is to become intimate with myriad things, with 10,000 things, with the dharmas, become intimate. An ancient said that non-mind enacts and fulfills the way of non-mind. Non-mind, what's that? I guess one way of thinking about it might be the mind, once body and mind have dropped away, as Dogen would say, or the mind once unencumbered by ego with just awareness. Just awareness without self-centering. And acting and fulfilling the way of non-mind, finally, you can rest. But proceeding, you are able to guide the assembly. So staying in that space of non-mind is perhaps not possible if you're going to survive because looking after the, the matters of this world <laughs> are important. providing food for yourself and others, providing for shelter, 
doing the things that are necessary to protect us from the elements and nourish us are important for survival. But being aware at the same time that there is this vast reality that is beyond all of that, all of that surviving is the way of not getting caught up in just surviving. So proceeding, you are able to guide the assembly, you're able to take care of things. But that recollection of the wider universe, of the larger space, with, allows us to have some clarity of thoughts and sitting silently, we can wander into the center of the circle of wonder. And achieve some rest. Just as Prince Andrew, after getting hit on the head, being forced by his incapacity to look at the sky and abandon his interest in this struggle about the cleaning rod, abandon his interest in the story of what was happening around him, was forced to just look at the sky and see that vast spaciousness and wander into the circle of wonder. So Sazen meditation is a way of allowing us to have access to that vastness, but it's not the only way. Maybe sometimes just getting hit in the head is another way. Or experiencing some great catastrophe or some work of art, like the passage from Tolstoy. Is a way of reminding us of that circle of wonder that is always available and present. So I, I think we'll we'll stop there, and um, I, I I wonder if if you have if you can think of if this prompts any kind of memories, any kind of recollections of experiences that you may have had. that served the role of getting hit on the side of the head. Or any other thoughts you have about these passages, whether they resonate with you or whether they don't. And uh, we'll break up into groups and discuss that a bit or anything else you want to discuss. And then we'll get back together shortly. Thank you very much for listening.